was a kid, there was a, a radio show uh, that was made famous by a guy named Paul Harvey. And there it is. There it is. Anyone remember what it was called? Yeah. I tried to give you a few hints as we went along here. The rest of the story. And basically, he, he became famous with generations of people by uh, simply starting with some story that his audiences knew about. And then he would recognize, but then he would zoom in on some aspect of the story that not everybody knew. And it usually brought forth an insight and a challenge. This morning, we look at the story of Jesus' baptism, plus we go to the book of Acts to see a follow-up to that. <clears throat> Luke has recorded the details in the book of Acts that were impressed by him as important by the Holy Spirit. And it follows the ministry of Paul and the early church, but it's part of a bigger story. Acts 19, while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast, where he found several believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He asked them. No, they replied. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Well, then what baptism did you experience? He asked. And they replied, the baptism of John. Paul said John's baptism called for repentance from sin. But John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. All right, let's give you a little bit of a picture here. In the chapter before this, Paul has been on basically an extended tour, preaching and teaching about how to faithfully follow Jesus' actions as a disciple of Jesus. Paul's travel in that one chapter alone included stops in Athens, Corinth, Sencre, Syria, Ephesus, Caesarea, Jerusalem, Antioch, Galatia, in Phrygia. And the Bible says that he held discussions. He was preaching the message. He was testifying. He was teaching. He greeted the church. And he was strengthening all the believers. And we know this took a while because, well, first of all, there were no turnpikes or airports or taxis. But because we know that he spent at least a year and a half in one of those places alone. Uh, in Corinth. And in our text this morning, he's at it again, and he ends up back at the city of Ephesus, where he had stopped briefly in his last set of travels. Well, the first thing that Luke tells us is that Paul gets there to Ephesus, and it was when Apollos was in Corinth. So who's Apollos? Well, if you look in the chapter before this, we see Apollos, and we get to understand why it's so important. At the end of the, that chapter, in verse 24, we find that Apollos was a Jew who was eloquent when he spoke and had a thorough knowledge of Scripture. But verse 25 of that chapter before then tells us that he had received instruction in the way of the Lord and in some of the Bibles you'll see way is capitalized with a W there because at this point they're not really calling people Christians yet they're just simply people who follow the way of Jesus and that was as close to a name for this uh, new sect that they had the way he, was a, he knew it so well that he was able to teach others correctly, in fact. 
But he ends up teaching and preaching in Ephesus, where Paul had stopped before that. And where Paul had not been able to stay long enough to explain things and really help the Ephesians to, to understand some of Jesus' teaching. And here comes Apollos, filling in the gap, teaching what he knows, and doing it really well. But the Bible goes on to say in Acts 18.25 that Apollos knew only the baptism of John. So here we are now in verse 19, chapter 19. Paul is encountering these Christians that Apollos had just seen and talked to before from that very same place, and he finds that they haven't heard of the Holy Spirit. They didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit, let alone have received the Holy Spirit. They, like Apollos before them, had only received a piece of the story. And they had followed the form of what they thought was good religious practice. They were baptized in the way that John the Baptist had done it, a baptism of repentance. Folks, without getting into the deep waters of baptismal theology, because you, you could write a book that thick and still not cover all of the, the different beliefs there are out there. But I, I think there are a couple things that we can pick up from this this morning that can make an impact with us as we minister here in Greene County and Fayette County. First of all, we, like Apollos and the Ephesian church that Paul encounters, we can have all the instruction and training about Jesus and still be missing a major piece of the story. The head knowledge about Jesus is good. And it's a great place to start. That's why we spend so much time and effort and money in having things like Sunday school and Bible school. We want our children, and even us as adults, to have the godly, Christ-centered head knowledge to make informed and godly decisions about salvation, about discipleship, about living in the midst of the world as an ambassador for Christ, and about worship. But we're learning about God, about Jesus. Then you step into worship, and you are worshiping him directly. And it is all to him. That's why Sunday school never stands alone. It's always in the context of a worshiping church. But that can't be where it ends. Like Apollos, it, it, it's not enough to simply be knowledgeable or eloquent or convincing. Luke spends several verses over the course of, the, of, of two chapters explaining the differences and the incompleteness of what Apollos and these Ephesian Christians were believing, the ones who only had the baptism of John. Their baptism was simply a response on their part to their own repentance. Baptism symbolized what they did. They repented. They made things right with God. Therefore, they got baptized. And twice, Scripture emphasizes that's not enough. Christian baptism is not just a symbolic representation of repentance. That became really clear when Jesus insisted that, G that John had to baptize him. Jesus didn't have anything to repent of. It obviously couldn't just be about repentance. Because Jesus did not repent. In John's mind, baptism represented a choice to repent. Jesus said this, not enough. But as is the case with so much in Jesus' ministry, he turned the whole idea of baptism around. It could no longer just be about repentance. Jesus refused John's request to baptize him because John knew that he messed up. And he insisted that John baptize Jesus. 
And true Christian baptism changed from that moment on. John found out from Jesus. Apollos found out from Aquila and Priscilla in the chapter before the one we read. And these Ephesian disciples found out from Paul. Christian baptism does not represent what you or I decide. That's why, let me just be clear. Our understanding, at least from the United Methodist side and, and, and many of the different denominations, it's sort of like, you know, we would call it a sacrament because there's something sacred happening. Think, um, we only have two sacraments, baptism and Holy Communion. Think Holy Communion. Do you celebrate Holy Communion because of the way you died on a cross? Because of the blood you shed? Because of the body that was broken? Your body? No, it's all about Him. We're Christian. It's supposed to be about Him. Jesus died on a cross. Jesus had a broken body. Jesus shed his blood. Baptism is about Jesus. It's about the way that God, before you ever even knew you were a sinner, God set you up so you could repent. God set you up so that you could find out that you needed him. If God hadn't set us up, we wouldn't even know that there's such a thing as sin. God, in the, in the theological terms, God poured out his grace. Grace just means he gives you the power to do something you don't have the power to do. God poured out his grace before you were even aware that you needed it. Scripture says, while we were yet sinners, God set it all up beforehand. And in baptism, we symbolize God pouring out his grace on you. That's why we as United Methodists don't get all hung up about baptizing infants or children. Because it's not about their repentance. It's about God. Choosing to pour out his grace and his mercy on people who were still sinners. On people who didn't even deserve the gift of salvation. And God chose them anyways. And babies, toddlers, children, teens, adults, and even senior citizens. All need God's grace equally. And God pours out his grace on each one. God, whether they've repented or not, baptism is a visible sign of what God has already done and is still doing. Offering grace and mercy to everyone. In fact, God teaches that God's, that his grace is what enables us to even experience the gift of repentance so that we can respond to Christ's offer's salvation. Now notice we're not saying repentance isn't important. You still have to respond to the gift of God's grace. You still have to respond and say, yeah, or no, 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 I don't want Jesus to pay the price for me. I want to go to hell on my own. You get that choice. God's not going to force you into heaven. You can choose to ignore what Jesus did. You can choose to ignore God's grace. You can choose to go to hell on your own. But it isn't God's plan for your life. Oh, I can't believe God would send somebody to hell. Well, you're right. He won't. But if you are doggedly determined to go, he will let you. Baptism represents God's grace being poured out. That's also why on the United Methodist side of things, we, we don't do what some people call rebaptisms. I mean, it's not like God looks down and says, Man, I must have really screwed it up with that burning. 
he must need to be baptized again because, man, it didn't take. Look at that boy. I didn't say it was this one. It was whatever one. You know, I didn't say it. Don't be assuming. God makes no mistakes. And if baptism symbolizes what God does and what God has done, you really need to not add in that God screwed up. That's not a good picture of God's grace. Well, preacher, I don't see why this is so important. What difference does it make? Well, I'm glad you asked that. It makes enough of a difference that God Almighty made sure it made it into the scriptural text. As part of the words that God gave for our instruction, our doctrine, our correction, and our training in righteousness. God himself thought it was important enough that it needed to be in the book. It makes enough of a difference that the Ephesians, who learned this from Paul, were baptized the Christian way. And then the Holy Spirit fell upon them. Once they understood it wasn't just about them deciding that they repented. They did it the right way. They did it in Jesus' name. I don't understand all that, but I know what my response needs to be. So what do we see here that we can apply in our day and age to, uh, to our situation in our lives? Well, first, on this day, when we remember Jesus' baptism, let's not get baptism and repentance confused. They're two different things. They're both important. But baptism is about what God does, not what we do. It is one of the ways that we witness to the world around us who witnesses the baptism. It's one of the ways we witness to God about God. Second, let's take a lesson from Paul. Make sure that we leave people like the and Priscilla like he did uh, in, the, in the chapter before, and I would encourage you to read that. Folks who can follow up and disciple new Christians. It's not enough to just have Sunday school and Bible school and a Bible study, but rather we want to entrust our young in age and young in faith to men and women who are living out the Christian walk of faith. That's why we try real hard to not have a, a murderer or a, a uh, liar or a whatever be teaching our Sunday school class. Somebody who's walking out the Christian life is, is the one we're looking for. If you're not following the way of Jesus, then you ought not be teaching the way of Jesus. Third, let's remember that our journey of faith, including our baptism, and also times when we respond to God, are nothing until we allow God to pour out his Holy Spirit on us and immerse us in his presence and in his power and fill us with his gifts. This morning I want to encourage yourself, encourage you to answer a question. Am I like those 12 Ephesians? Trying to be faithful, doing all the right things as best as we can understand them, and yet still basing our entire Christian walk on our own efforts because you're not going to be successful if so I invite you to reach out in prayer to God and allow him to take you beyond mere religious response and fill you with his Holy Spirit so that your life would be marked by the outpouring and experience of grace and mercy and even the people around you would see that you are a man or woman of grace a man or woman of mercy, because that's what God's like. <laughs> and perhaps you've already come to that place where you've gone beyond the head knowledge, and you, you have experienced the power of God coming upon your life. If so, then Scripture says that he has poured out a spiritual gift upon you. They happen to get the, the gift of tongues. 
And that may not be the one he gave you. But if you have received this Holy Spirit, you have received a spiritual gift. At least one. If you don't know what that is, we need to talk. And, you, and we need to be praying so that you would know. Folks, I hope you walk away today with an understanding that it's not just about doing things the religiously right way. There are churches out there that you have to, to be saved, you have to have the right set of words in a particular sinner's prayer. And you have to be baptized the right way at the right age with the right amount of water. But what I see here is, it's about him, not us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would draw us to you, that our spirituality, our Christianity, would be more than doing the religious stuff. Lord, help us step beyond the idea of John the Baptist who was doing a Jewish baptism ritual, a ritual of, of, of repentance found in the Jewish tradition. And let us take that step that Jesus took and turn baptism into a wonderful declaration that God loves the world and has poured out his grace even on one like me. Which makes it available to everybody. Like Christ's love is available to everybody. Lord, help us. And if there are people here who have accepted you as Lord and Savior, and have not yet found their spiritual gift, then Lord, I ask that you this week would make it very clear to them, not only that they have received one, because Scripture's pretty clear there, if they have been baptized in Christ and have believed on him as their Savior, then he has given the outpouring of the Holy Spirit with the spiritual gift at least one, if they don't know what that is, Lord, help them this week to understand that they have one, a spiritual gift and what that gift might be. And Lord, in all of this, help us to remember to follow your ways. It's not about whether we're right and somebody else is wrong. It's about when we point people back to Jesus, back to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I would invite you to turn in your hymnal because it's not on the screen. And uh, in a second, I'll find a bulletin and know where to send you.